so yes, I have this talk. It's going to be short, as I said, and a little bit not going anywhere. Uh, it begins with some uh, data that I always find a little bit pleasant to find data. Uh, it presents a theory that the data that does not uh, accommodate the data. And so what else is needed to accommodate those data? I'm not going to give you the theory that I think explains it because I don't have it. Uh, I don't care particularly very much about the little data, but I care about the wider significance of the theory that should explain those data. And I don't have anything to say about that either, so it's going to gesture towards, uh, at the end it's going to be completely open-ended, and the idea will be like, uh, huh, isn't this interesting? What we're going to do about this, right? Just why it would matter if I'm roughly right about, uh, about what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, the title, I think many of you know where this is going. Uh, the good thing is that if you didn't know and you checked on Google, this Find a Stranger in the Alps, and uh, recently somebody wrote a song. And so you get the first 10, 20 hits are about the song, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm after. Only a few years ago, if you Googled Find a Stranger in the Alps, Alps you could, would go immediately to the point. This is one of the most classic, ridiculous examples of, uh, well, I shouldn't call it censorship. But, uh, and it's related to the film uh, The Big Lebowski. So I'm going to show you a little bit of Big Lebowski, if everything works. <coughs> Okay, let's see. Oops. It will start eventually. Okay. This is what happens, Larry. You see what happens, Larry? You see what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps? This is what happens. You see what happens, Larry? You see what Right, okay. Not uh, perfect, but anyway. So that's the story, right? Uh, the story is uh, the character played by John Goodman, Walter, uh, is irritated by the young kid that you see very briefly in the window. And uh, in order to take revenge on the kid, he goes out on the street and he starts destroying uh, the car, which he thinks is the kid's car and happens not to be. He got the wrong car. Right? Uh, and you probably might have heard what, what he said. What he said is really, is really this. Okay, no, I got a problem. All right, okay, so far so, so good. Right, so sorry about this. Okay, let's go back. So you've heard it right, the, um, what, what the character says. So that's a character played by, by John Goodman, the name of the character in the movie, a fictional character. is Walter, and he says this, right? This is what happens, Larry. Do you see what happens, Larry? Do you see what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps, which is, you know, don't be worried if you never heard this idiom, because it's not an English idiom. Nobody ever heard this before. Uh, the original, the, the Coen brothers' original, is this, right? Do you see what happens, Larry? Do you see what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass? So it's quite <laughs> different. And I suppose they came up with a stranger in the Alps because it fits the, 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 the movement of, of the lips of the character, so that it was, it was all right. Uh, but the idea was, okay, you got what the idea was, not to offend the Comedy Central family-oriented audience, I suppose. They had to substitute some, uh, some um, coarse words, fuck a stranger in the ass, uh, with something that is complete nonsense, right? Anyway, uh, the nonsense bit is not particularly interesting, is the fact that they wanted to avoid the occurrence of uh, fuck a stranger in the ass. Uh, it's the phenomenon that I'm going to talk about today, but just to continue, since I interrupted at the beginning, just to get some continuity, let me give, give you a couple of other examples, because this is ubiquitous. I've got uh, from Kill Bill, the character says, my name is Buck and I'm here to party in the, in the edited version. In this case, you even lose the nice phonetic rhyming original, which is, my name is Buck and I'm here to fuck, right? Which is good. <laughs> Uh, and the next one that I got is, in fact, if anything, a little bit sinister because they wanted to remove the coarse term, but look what they came up with. They came up with a word that is absolutely not coarse, is normal, but it's extremely offensive to the targeted uh, audience for completely different reason. And so uh, Joe Pesci, the character played by Joe Pesci, doesn't say, you motherfucking Jew. 
He says, you mother lover Jew. And the mother loving, of course, is the most horrible stereotype that we have for Jews. So it was not a very good idea, right? But the point is that money loving goes down fine with mom and dad, whereas motherfucker uh, doesn't go uh, particularly well. Right? OK, uh, the phenomenon has got nothing very much to do with fiction. I'm going to say a little bit at the beginning about these fictional scenarios. I think there's something interesting there. I don't have much to say about it, but perhaps you do. But anyway, the point that I want to bring up with this example of uh, uh, fictional slurs that get edited away is also a point that you might reproduce with what I call similar phenomena. Well, one that I have is still in the fictional element, Grolixes. Those are those squiggles that appear in the comic bubbles that stand for their code for some sort of generic slur. And what you're supposed to infer from this comic is that, for example, the character on the left uttered the word what and the word the because they're written down. But then he didn't utter a word that is not a token of any English uh, type, namely dash, at, and so on. He uttered a, 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 a bad word, and you pretty much substitute what you want, probably what the shit, what the fuck, something like that. Right? Uh, so another example in which uh, the fictional uh, coarse expression is being edited away in favor of something else. In the case of the movies, you've got to pay attention, perhaps, to the lip movement, and so you come up with these absurdities. In the case of Grolixes, you have a conventional device for that. But, you know, comics, presumably children don't like, shouldn't be exposed to those bad words, and so you come up with these uh, substitutions. Uh, well, when it comes to slurs, I've got nothing to say especially about slurs in particular, in the sense of ethnic, uh, sexual, uh, and similar things, slurs. But slurs are also, among other things, bad words, just like to fuck or shit, all that sort of stuff, motherfucker. Uh, and and that, that's why I, I occasionally bring up slurs. And in the case of slurs, well, in the case of, I think for us, contemporary Westerner, the most charged slurs, or at least the most famous, Chancellors, we come up with things such as this, the N word, right? We do not like to say the word. And in fact, this is the only word in the whole presentation that I do not like to pronounce. And there's, there's a point uh, in this. Well, I got no, no problem with saying fucking shit, but I got some problems with even tokening those words. Okay, but I'll get to that fact. To that fact. And we have similar things for fucking, fucking shit. We have the F word, and we have effing. What is that effing bastard doing? Right? And effing is not a term of English. Well, it's not a term of English. These things get slowly lexicalized. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually you find it in the Oxford English dic Dictionary, effing. But even if it wasn't originally, you understand that it's sort of a metacode that stands for a word. And in this case, the word is clearly the F word, which in this case is fuck, right? pretty much. Always, except, by the way, since we're all interested in linguistics, for uh, Zwicky's paper, the other F word, which is faggot. Right? And Zwicky has a very nice paper about the derogatory uses for homosexuals. Uh, a little case of Italian, since I'm Italian and you might be interested in data, we got this. This is very lexicalized, unfortunately. It's not on the fly. But we also have things that are just made up on the spot. Is uh, zio cane. Zio means, as you can Guess means uncle. We've got nothing against uncle. The point that zio is there is just because it sounds like dio, which means god. And so zio cane is a substitute for, for us, the worst thing you can utter in Italian, which is blasphemy. Right? Um, right. So zio cane is, is completely lexicalized, but we get things, my friends come up with things like dio re, dio cantante, which you never heard before. Right? And they're just there in order to know, you know, I'm going to be blasphemous. But I don't like the people around to hear the bad word. I don't like the bad word to echo. That's exactly what I'm talking about in all of these cases. Because what's interesting about this phenomena is that they appeal all, not only in news, right? For example, in the effing case, right? You effing bastard. I didn't want to say you fucking bastard. But I use the term, and I use this sort of substitute for the term. But what's more important is they occur also in cases in which you might think they are semantically inert or indifferent or harmless. That's why I brought up fictional scenarios. What's so bad about hearing Walter, 
who does not exist, fictionally utter the word, uh, what was it, uh, fuck a stranger in the ass. Nobody's doing that. Nobody uttered anything like that. Nobody derogated, nobody used coarse language because there is no actual use there. It's fiction. John Goodman pretended to be somebody who used a swear word, but nobody really did it. So what's the problem? Well, of course we know what the problem is. We don't want the kids to hear the word. We don't like the sound. We don't want the sound to echo out. Uh, we are philosophers, and so you know what's going to be the big test for this, of course, quotation. And the interesting thing is that these things are relevant also in quoted examples, and that's why I brought up the O.J. Simpson trial. In the O.J. Simpson trial, nobody would even have dreamt to use any slur, be the actual N-word, or N-word used as effing. They weren't using it, they were quoting it. They were asking the policeman who actually used the word whether he ever used that word. So what's the problem? Put it in scare quote, you're not using it. You're neutralizing the word completely. Why would anybody be offended? Well, of course, many people would be offended, and that's why the lawyers had to come up with, uh, Detective Furman, have you ever used the N word? Even though, had they not been squeamish, sensitive, what they would have done is, at best, to cite, to display a token. So what's wrong with that? Okay? We are all familiar with the even more extreme cases. We are getting towards the slightly excessive, but I don't think it was as excessive as many people thought. The case of niggardly. Niggardly is a term that means being, you know, um, not liking to spend money, being a miser. Right? The etymology has got nothing to do with the N word, and in fact, I have it here. Uh, the word niggardly, miserly, is etymologically derived from the Old Norse word nig, stingy, and the Middle word nigging, mi Middle English word nigging. So absolutely nothing. This is exactly like the famous Quinian cat in catatonic. Catatonic has got nothing to do with cats. Niggardly has not, got nothing to do with word. Uh, an academic got fired temporarily for having used the word because people got offended. And then he managed to make the case, and most people thought this is absurd. Well, yes, okay, fine, perhaps taking things a little bit too far, but, you know, it wasn't as if he had said London, and somebody got offended. You see, you see there's a point there, right? And the point is that the sheer display of the sound, or something sufficiently close to the sound, seems to have something, some effect. And it's something that, uh, I think you mentioned something close to that in... in, in, in in the question to Eleonora, right, with sort of some words you just don't want, as I said, I keep repeating, you just don't want the kids to hear it. Oh yeah, your example was when the kids don't even know what it means. Yeah. They don't know neither the truth conditional meaning, if it has one, or the derogatory dimension. They just know it's a bad word. They sound, I shouldn't use it. And either I, I, I use it to boast, to show that I'm, you know, I'm an adult, or I use it because I know you get irritated, and all you know is that he's trying to irritate me. So that was a perfect example, right? Of where <clears throat> the sound seems to be doing something. Well, sounds can do lots of things. We know the difference between the kick and the blob, right? When you say so, say. but not in this case. There's really nothing in the sound itself that does the work. It's got to be a sound with the convention of English. That's why a certain word beginning with N is so charged. Whereas, I don't know, nobody beginning with N is not. <clears throat> right? So there's got to be something conventional that has to do with meaning, and yet something that does what meaning is never supposed to do, which is jump out of everything. Right? We are actually affected by it when we hear it in fiction, we are actually affected by it when we see it simply mentioned, and sometimes we are even affected by it when it occurs purely accidentally in some word. So a, di a conventional dimension that has these very peculiar properties. And that's <coughs> the dimension that I call taboo, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about taboo. The phenomenon, I call it the resistance of taboo. There seems to be a dimension of conventional meaning, in fuck, in faggot, in the n-word, in all of these things, a dimension of conventional meaning that is very special, that really resists even all the devices that we have for, in scare quote, neutralizing meaning. Right? It, it really seems to have, be a dimension of meaning that has to do with making the sound, just making the noise. Right? <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about 
taboo. And what I'm going to say about taboo is to contrast it with another dimension of meaning that is a little bit special, but for everybody who works on these things is not that special anymore. Right? It's become pretty much very clear, unless you know you people like me who get into it. But you know, since 2003, Chris Potts book, what people talked about it long before, Kaplan 99. Uh, anticipated that, and if you really want to be a bit uh, generous and creative, Frege in, in, at the beginning of the century had things roughly in that area. Okay, so we've got good old fashioned meaning that we learned when we were kids about this kind of fancy meaning that I'm going to talk about now, and then taboo, which is yet another thing. Right? So there's a third level of meaning, and taboo is not sufficiently well. Understood, except for recognizing that you shouldn't say the word. That's a bad word by convention. Right? <clears throat> so, an introduction to non-truth conditional meaning. Non-truth conditional meaning is this new but by now familiar species of meaning. Right? Uh, uh, very much what Eleonora was talking about in parts of, of the paper and what I think many of us are by now, you know, we got, we got different theories as usual, but you know, we got theories. Right, so it's definitely, it's a hot topic. Right? Let's put it like that. And then I'll show you why taboo really is not like that. And then I will gesture towards taboo and why I think it's important. Not taboo itself, but what taboo shows for the study of semantics. Okay, so. <clears throat> now, as you can see, I'm dumping together all the phenomena that have been put under the label of non-truth conditional meaning, and I should say, oh yeah. I'm warm, but if I take this off, the microphone goes away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck with this. Um, <clears throat> I'm putting together all the things that people usually, a bit, unless you're an empirical linguist, you dump together under the label of expressive, expressive content. And so I put together slurs, but without caring about the political, social, sexual dimension that are important for slurs in and of themselves. Uh, register, bad words as opposed to the normal words, and a lot of other things that are perhaps part of register, such as the difference between scientific terms and their everyday equivalent, or in this case, child-directed speech, uh, such as the difference between bunny and rabbit. Right? So let me say a little bit about child-directed speech. Uh, <coughs> Child-directed speech up to 20 years ago was called motheries because apparently it was mothers who speak to children. We were too busy earning money. Uh, now it's become child-directed speech, fine. Uh, the idea is, okay, 90% of the people I talk to, English speakers, tell me that bunnies are rabbits. They're just the same thing. It's just that when you speak to a child, you, call, you like to call them bunny. Some people think that a nice, nasty, big rabbit, you wouldn't call it a bunny, that a bunny is cuddly. Okay, then bad example. So let's go for the vast majority of English speakers, right? Uh, bunny and rabbits are truth conditionally equivalent. They designate the same species, the rabbit. Rabbit is, I suppose, highly negotiable, but I suppose neutral. You can use it with children, you can use it in a zoology class, and you can use it every day. Bunny is not. Bunny is a little bit funny if I use it with you. If I use it with you, I would be exploiting this dimension of meaning. For example, among lovers, you would use that kind of talk. Precisely because you like to exploit the, the innocence associated with child-directed speech. And it would be completely out of place to use bunny in a zoology class. Right? Okay. So you got a conventional dimension of meaning, conventional. You gotta you got know English to know that when to use bunny. You gotta know English to know that it's funny if I go to the doctor and say, I have a boo-boo in my tummy, even though it's truth conditional equivalent to I have a pain in my stomach. Right? So it's a conventional meaning and it's part of register that distinguishes those two. Same thing in the case of coarseness. And here, obviously for psychological reasons that I really don't understand, uh, bathroom and bedroom are where we are lexically the most creative. We have scientific, prissy, um, politically correct, uh, kind of nasty and obscene words for exactly the same thing. Hmm? So I've given you copulate, engage in sexual intercourse, make love, 
stuff like that. Uh, and eventually you go to FOC and all these variants and you know, in Italian I could go on for ages with that. Uh, right. uh, I'm assuming, again, again from, for the sake of the example, that they designate the same activity. Okay? So if X uh, fucked Y, X and Y copulated, or they had sexual intercourse. It's exactly the same truth conditional meaning. If one is true, the other is. It's not a question of truth conditional content. And yet, there, of course, there are differences, the differences in register that make one expression uh, appropriate in certain settings, depending on who you're talking to, what kind of uh, situation you're talking in, um, things like that, uh, whereas others are not. Some are perhaps neutral, such as rabbit. Use it anytime you like. Uh, when it comes to sex, I think it's very difficult to find one that is completely neutral. Right? Engaging sexual intercourse is very journalese. Right? You surely wouldn't, you know, do, do, after a romantic dinner, tell your partner, would you like to engage in sexual intercourse? Okay. Uh, okay. Fuck, definitely. If you're writing for The Guardian, you better know. But you won't. Use that. Okay, uh, slurs are for me just an example of this, which doesn't mean that they are exactly the same phenomenon. Of course, everything that Eleonora talked about is probably not applicable to my first two examples, but applicable here. But as far as I'm concerned, Italian and WAP are exactly extensionally, intentionally, in fact, uh, coextensive. They designate exactly the same class of individuals, those of Italian descent, or so I assume. Uh, in Italian, Meridionale and Terrone, that I'm pretty sure about, they are exactly the same people, the people from the south. Except that the first one is neutral, or so I assume, and the second one is uh, derogatory. It's charged. It's got a dimension of meaning which is derogatory. Hmm? You can say terrible things about southerners by using med Meridionale, but it wouldn't be linguistically encoded derogation, right? Which is the phenomenon that interests me, because it's a phenomenon that has to do with meaning. Okay, so that's, uh, there's an extra bit of meaning there. Right? There's truth conditional meaning, the extension, or the intention, or whatever your favorite phenomenon is. And then there's this other bit that tells you use it when speaking to such and such, don't use it at the dinner table, you don't use it with the queen, or do use it with the emperor, and all of those things. Uh, the best, by the way, studied class of all this from a serious linguistic viewpoint is honorifics, which you have in Spanish, we surely have it in Italian, right? Uh, German, not English. So. But anyway, forget about that. Um, dictionaries agree. So this is really intuitive. Dictionaries, decent dictionaries, come up with things like this. WAP, what does it mean? What does it stand for? for? It stands for Italians. Okay, am I done? That's all I need to learn. No, 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 look, italics, derogatory, be careful. It stands for Italian. It doesn't mean that it stands for derogation. It stands for Italian period. And then you're supposed to know what derogatory uses mean, which means, you know, use it as at your peril, so to speak. To fuck, to engage in sexual intercourse, coarse. It's a word in a special register. You want to be coarse, use it. But if you're a competent speaker, you know that's what's going to happen. Right? OK, so how do we Okay, sorry. Yeah, so all nice, the dictionaries, my intuitions, and all of that, they go fine. Well, as linguist, as semanticist, uh, we can do better. And I, again, very familiar. Uh, how do we do better? Well, we check what happens when you put those things inside the things that affect truth conditions, that have something to do with truth conditional content. And if I'm right, if the dictionary is right, if my common sense is right, all these things, all these extra dimensions of meaning should remain completely indifferent to the operators that affect truth conditional meaning. Conclusion, it's part of non-truth conditional meaning, right? Okay, what this is, is a phenomenon that we now call, after Chris Potts, lone displacement. Philosophers call it, very bad idea, but they call it scoping out. It's jumping out. Uh, the, the linguists call it projection. It's just that there's many different kinds of projections, and we're all discussing what kind of projections this is. Is this like a presupposition? Is it a different kind of projection, like most people seem to think? And all of that uh, stuff. So let me, let me run this too. Look at this. If there were more WAPs around here, we'd have better pizza. Truth conditional content. 
Are you committed to the fact that there are more Italians here? No. You can say, hey, you didn't hear me. I said, if there were. I didn't say there are. So if is an, uh, 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 an operator that affects truth conditional content. Great, no surprises here. But how about the derogation? If I object to the speaker and say, hey, what you got with Italians? What's your language, right? Um, the speaker can't justify himself or herself by saying, hey, I said if. No, right? The derogation jumps out. The derogation is indifferent to anything that affects truth conditions. Reasonable conclusion, the derogatory effect has nothing to do with truth conditional meaning. It's a different dimension of meaning. They did not fuck. Right? At dinner table, and somebody said, hey, hey, what's your language? What's the problem? I said not. Right? Well, no, it doesn't work like that. You put a negation in it, yes, so you deny that they had sex, but you didn't cancel anything about your use of coarse language. That's vulgar. You shouldn't do it. Right? So it, the, the, the derogatory term, unlike its truth conditional component, remains unaffected by the expression of negation, the most classic truth conditional, in fact, truth functional even, operator. Right? Okay. So we all talk about these things, and these are a very uh, few people that talked about that, uh, on top of Christopher Potts, Kratzer, <coughs> Anand Schlenker, he thinks that it's a little bit, it's in fact very, very much like a presupposition. Uh, Potts says, no, it's not. I think it's absolutely not. But anyway, whatever it is, it's not a conditional meaning in this sense. right? Uh, okay, hold all the objections about metalinguistic negation, which is a completely different story. They did not fuck. They had sexual intercourse. Oh, that's fine, but that's a non-truth conditional operator with metalinguistic negation. So, <clears throat> right. So, what are we going to do with this? We got to make a theory. People made a theory. I got my little theory, so I present you the theory because I'm speaking here, so you get my stuff. Uh, but the most famous theory is different. It's much more refined, and it's Chris Potts. Chris Potts uses a, a type, Buntagovian type uh, theory, and he gives a different type to the expressive dimension. Right? So you got the classic two Buntagovian types, entity and truth value for nouns, referential stuff, and propositions, and then S, which is the expressive type. Right? He calls it S because, well, I suppose because E was already taken by the entity type, but also because he thinks, and this is interesting, he thought in 2003, uh, that all these things go together with supplements. They pretty much do the same things as non-restrictive relative clauses do. Uh, if Kepa, who is a Frenchman, came to the party, we would all be happy. Right? And you tell me, no, Kepa is not French. Hey, I said if. No, I can't do that. Right? That jumps out because it's a supplement. Okay, we don't care about supplements here because they're probably a little bit less the same thing that Potts thought, but anyway. So, here's my take just to make things simple. Uh, classes of context, right? And Eleonora was already talking in, in that uh, vein. So I distinguish the class of context in which Mario is a WAP is true, which is supposed to reflect its truth conditional meaning. It's a class of all contexts such that in that context Mario is Italian completely indistinguishable from the neutral counterpart. But the class of, well, I called it, it's expressively licensed, I think, use. Not a good idea because use is more a purpose for taboo. We'll get to that. So I put an N. The class of non-defective, linguistically non-defective. Right? There's much to, to be said, much defectivity in, in using racial slurs. But the class of linguistically non-defective things is something like this. A class of context such that the agent, the speaker, regards Italians as unworthy of respect very loosely. What am I supposed to put here? Perhaps the many alternatives that Eleanor mentioned, perhaps something about stereotypes, who knows? I just gave you a little example. Right? The class of context in which Bugsy is the one is true is simply the class of context such that in the possible world of the context, Bugsy is a rabbit. But the class of context in which Bugsy is a bunny is appropriately used is a class of context such that the addressee is a child. Super rough. Go and read the social linguistic literature on child directed speech to make it a little bit better. Okay. So what's interesting here is, in a very loose sense, these things are kind of conceptual. Right? 
I used that clauses in both cases. Right? This sentence, its truth conditional meaning is representable as the class of context such in which it is true that Mario is an Italian. The class of context in which Mario is a WAP is non-defectively used is the class of context in which it is true that the speaker deems Italians to be unworthy of respect or something like that. The class of context in which uh, Bugs is a man is true is the class of context in which it is true that Bugs is a rabbit. The class of context in which uh, fuck is appropriately used, non-defectively used, is the class of context in which it is true that the speaker speaks in a low register. Roughly like that. But anyway, contentful things. Of course, contents that play very different roles, as we've seen. One is true conditional content. The other is this kind of fluffier thing that affects the class of context for non-defective use. Still pretty contentful. Yes, Potts told us correctly, I think, that when, I tr when we try to make these things very, very precise, uh, and Eleanor too said this kind of vague stereotypes sometimes, right? Yeah, there's a little bit of ineffability. It's difficult to pin down exactly the content that we want here. That's why I put the three dots. But content it is, right? Perhaps a vaguely defined class of contents, but anyway, content it is. Right? Okay, so all of this is the stuff that I want to contrast uh, taboo with. Because at this point, you might think, and in fact, we were thought to think, oh, look, big, uh, you know, the 90s. What happens here? We discover that we've done philosophy for 50 years thinking that meaning was just truth conditional meaning. We did semantics, and people like, you know, people who are not exactly uh, the silly ones told us, that's David Lewis, so you can imagine, told us semantics without truth conditions is not semantics. Well, semantics is the study of meaning, so that means that, you know, meaning is truth conditional meaning, according to this slogan. Uh, I'm sure Lewis would tell you, yeah, in the paper I was writing, I was concerned about that. I didn't even think about fucking and bunnies, but anyway. Uh, but many people did take him seriously. And for, I think, a long time we thought that, yes, yeah, semantics deals with truth conditions because that's what meaning is. And now in the 90s, whatever it is, let's... You know, Kaplan and then Potts, uh, we found out that no, there's more to semantics than truth condition. There's all the stuff that's known truth conditional meaning, this extra contentful bit floating around. Okay? And so you might think, whew, done, finally, right? It was already a pain to study truth conditional meaning, the whole big thing of semantics in the 70s and 80s and so on. Now we've got the other thing, we are still discussing a bit, but at least, you know, got a picture. So meaning is content, and I call it bias. It's the restriction on the class of context of use, that which I called CN, and in the slide afterwards I called CU because I made a typo, because I was thinking of my old terminology. Okay? But that, you might think, right? So that's it. Truth conditional meaning and this expressive meaning. Perhaps I should call it more neutrally. Expressive meaning, I call it bias. The restriction, right? This, the bias of Barney is use it when speaking to children. The bias of fuck is use it when you want to speak coarsely, vulgarly, and so on. Is that it? And I'm saying, no, I don't think so. That's why I think that taboo is a little bit important, because taboo is yet another dimension of meaning. And it's a dimension of meaning that seems to have to do with the tokens, with venting the thing, putting it inside a longer word, put it in quotation mark, put it in the mouth of a fictional speaker, that thing is going to bother us. And it's going to bother us not because of the unpleasant sound, but because of the conventions of English. So it's meaning. There's nothing to do. If you, if you don't know English, you would not be bothered by fuck at all. Right? You got to know the thing. You got to know what it is. Um, right, so there's yet another dimension of meaning. And where this dimension of meaning comes in our understanding of semantics is I think a little bit troublesome, or at least interesting, promising, depending on how you think about it. So, uh, yeah, you see, the, the occurrence of slurs is, I, I call it marked, is remarkable, it might bother us, or you might find it a little bit titillating, or however you react to these things. In fictional scenarios, in accidental occurrences, in pure quotation, and here I put in, by the way, uh, a personal anecdote. When I was a kid, around 12, 14 maybe, 
I, I was in England in the summer to learn English and hanging out with some English kids. And uh, they knew I was Italian, Italian and French, you know, they're English, they're all the same continental shit. So they asked me, uh, because they knew that something funny was going to happen, what's the French translation for seal? And I don't know French, but I happen to know this one. And it's folk, right? Folk in Italian. Oh, ho, 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 ho. wonderful, it's wonderful. So I was always asked to say, and I didn't know, by the way, at the time, because I didn't know much English, that it's really for an English speaker sounds very much like fuck. And so, yes, so that's another thing, right? What on earth is just the sound? It's not even spelled the same. It's not exactly the same sound, by the way. Uh, and yet it does the work. Mm. The res Fantastic, Siri is checking mother is for me. A bit, yeah, a bit, a bit late because I mentioned it half an hour ago, but this is great. Good. Oh, Cupertino. Um, right, so another little silly way of making the same point again, sorry. How to object a dinner table if somebody keeps saying, oh, I fucked that one. Uh, well, first of all, there's a truth conditional meaning which is a completely different thing. It's got nothing to do with language. Don't talk about sex or bathroom issues at dinner table. Yeah? So don't talk, don't use fuck and don't use copulate and use anything and I want to know about that. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. The second thing you can do is don't say fuck at dinner table and that's a classic thing that the kids love. You fell for it. You said fuck, right? No, I didn't say fuck in a, in a sense, right? I would be like, I just mentioned fuck. I didn't say fuck. And I keep saying fuck and the children love it because the taboo is, is uh, there. So that's what you do. Don't use the F word at table. That's why we come up with that. Precisely because of the resistance of the, the dimension of meaning across all those things. And now for me, the, the, the crucial one is quotation marks. Right? Quotation marks, I take them a little bit naively, but you know, you can stipulate the quotation marks are just devices of pure quotation, the classic one, the one that we know, the logician quotation marks. What they do, they, they neutralize concept, right? They neutralize truth conditional, conceptual meaning. John is short, well, perhaps he is, but John is short, says something completely different. It doesn't neutralize it, I mean, it shifts it. Right? It talks about something completely different, it talks about the world. I like bunnies, you better use it only with children. I like bunnies, use it with anyone you want. You just say that you like this word. And if you know the word, you're going to use it with children, but that's not what you're talking about. So all of this, you see quotation marks, really cancel out everything. That's what should not allow for scoping out. You can't jump out of quotation marks if you're semantic, right? Because quotation marks are there to de-semanticize the thing, to give you just the pure sound. And yet, Taboo shows that there is something conventionally attached to the pure sound, to the sheer type, to the F-U-C-K, or to the N-I-G, and so on. So the resistance of taboo shows a non-conceptual dimension of meaning. I don't know how much I want to push this idea, but right, it's not... What is... Give me a that clause for that. I can't know that clause. It's just that that sound doesn't fit here. That's not a sound that we like. Right? So on top of being, uh, of having a certain truth conditional meaning, on top of being derogatory, coarse, and so on, this word also had that freaking sound that we don't want. And that's a convention of English. So it's a bit of meaning. Right? It's a bit of semantics that resist quotation, so to speak. That's a strange thing, I think. Right. It's a strange thing. Why? Well, I'm, uh, I don't know. I find it a strange thing and something needs to be said. I just, this is the final bit where I gesticulate and I just try to make it a bit theoretical by mentioning Chomsky, which is always a good thing. Um, where is meaning for these people? Well, for Chomsky, I have got no clue. No, complete nonsense, spoken by the greatest intellectual of the 20th century, spoken about semantics. Uh, but, okay, Chomskyans, right? we think uh, the classic model is what happens to our competence of language? You got the syntactic competence, okay, and that's what those people do best, right? Syntax, different levels depending on the year. You got three, you got one, you got five levels of syntactic according to government of binding, but whatever you pick. And then something happens, right? Things go down. 
but now you got the syntax in the stomach, and things uh, go down, and then there's a bifurcation, right? There's something that goes into logical form, and there's something that goes in phonological form. So here there's a lot of things that happen, uh, well, formation rules, case theory, binding, all, all of those things that they love. Uh, movement, right? So you get to something, depending on the year, it's got a different name, right? Here you're gonna have things that are really the same in structure, but they do something different. More kind of transformation rules. Quantify arising is the one that I know, but I'm sure there's a couple of other ones, right? But anyway, it's all syntactic, and you get to this. This is the silent word of logical form. This is where you move things around. It's like, what do you mean, move the quantifier? Didn't you hear me? I said someone before everyone. Yeah, okay, but you know, that's conceptual movement and that's what's gonna get interpreted. Okay, great, except that we like to speak to each other and we have to make sounds, otherwise everything stays inside my head. And so something happens that goes into phonetic form. This is the great uh, pineal gland of Chomskyan uh, syntax. The great mystery is spell out. Something goes into the sensory motor system because for him everything is inside the skin, right? So it goes directly to the, to the mouth or sign language. Right? And so it goes like this. The sensory motor system and you make sounds and then you do phonology, phonetics and all of that funky stuff. Uh, and on this other st uh, thing, it goes to the conceptual interface, to the conceptual system, call it what you want. You do semantics. Semantics couldn't be less interested in this. Why? Because we know it from the first time we studied logic. Oh, English is a mess. The words that come first, in fact, should be interpreted over there. Scope ambiguities, just to give you yet another example. All sorts of ambiguities uh, and all of that stuff, right? So forget about that. That's what happens. The silence of semantics. Semantics is a very pure thing. You don't, shouldn't hear a beep in semantics. Unfortunately, you know, to write a paper, you have to give an example, right? Dog is a noun that stands for the property of being a dog. Fine, but I couldn't care less about dog. I just care about a representative of that particular truth conditional meaning in this case, or now that we're getting smarter, non-truth conditional meaning, right? If there's a bias, it's gonna be there. It's attached to the word fuck by virtue of the conventions of English, conventions of meaning, conceptual. F-U-C-K, you don't see it here. What you see is having sexual intercourse and being coarse. WAP, you hear Italian and being derogatory, or something like that. It's all here, it better be all here, right? Because that's semantics. We deal with logical forms. We couldn't care less about whether words are spoken loudly or softly, whether my S's are a little bit strange, and all that stuff. We couldn't care less about what word occur, occurs third in a sentence, like linear order. We don't care, we got the trees, we got hierarchical. Okay, so we have things like this. Bad example because it's unbiased, I think. But anyway, law and order. Ah, mysteriously classified as a sentence. <laughs> it's obviously uh, not, but anyway. Uh, okay, and so in this case you get this, right? Conjunction of law and order. Um, and so truth conditions and bias. Yes, I think it happens to be the super trivial bias. There's no particular bias here. I should have used bunny or fuck to get you something. And then in this case, you get the funky things like English speakers put an R in the middle for very bizarre reasons. Law and order, right, they say. They don't say law and order. They say law and order in Britain. Okay, so phonological, uh, phonology does its stuff completely unrelated to meaning. It better be, that's a foundational principle of phonology, right? Uh, and, the other, and the other side, the foundational principle of semantics, all the conventions are there independently of sound, pretty much. Sound is a handy representative for our examples, but really, who cares? Well, apparently we better care. Apparently we better care because fuck a stranger in the ass, this is a verb phrase, I got this right. <laughs> Um, right? You get the logical form, we know that. Truth conditions. Oh, by the way, this is metaphorical. It's something I completely ignored. He's not thinking about the sexual act 
you know, of engaging in anal sex. He's thinking about screwing up somebody. And by the way, screwing up is another one. Right? But anyway, I can't help it. So forget about the metaphorical, which we know is pragmatic, it's out of the picture. But literally, fuck a stranger in the ass has certain truth conditions, you know what they are, and it has a certain bias, which I assume is just being coarse language. Perhaps I'm wrong, there's something else. Perhaps it is even derogatory to some people. I don't know, but anyway, all of that, all the interesting stuff, and yet there seems to be this. That's all I can do. This is my theory, my theory so far. <laughs> Taboo has got to be there. It's got to be a dimension of a meaning that is attached to phonology, trickling down there somehow. <coughs> uh, okay, I'm concluding. So I call it, that's a, that's a research program at, at best. That's, I don't know, the beginning, that's a title for a research program. Now I've got to write the whole thing. Meaning at PF, right? meaning at phonological form. The meaning of sheer sounds, the stuff that somehow, not always, right? But so I will have to put a lot of dots on the I's and, and cross the T's, but uh, semantic non equivalence of, okay, I call it fully synonymous expressions. I mean, fully synonymous is not felicitous because I think that at the end of the day they don't have the, really the same meaning. The taboo is different. But anyway, uh, in the sense of content and bias, right? For example, super negotiable. But these two are two terms that are used uh, truth conditionally synonymous with African-American, or at least black person. Uh, both of them are derogatory, quite derogatory. I suppose not equally derogatory, but let's grant me the example. Derogatory, you gotta be a racist to use, to use those terms. I think the first one has a very weak taboo. I'm not particularly bothered about saying spook in this sense. Right? I'm not particularly worried, even if I know that there's a lot of the sense of spook that has to do with ghosts, that's got nothing to do with this. But even, even if it wasn't the case, it seems to me that conventionally, perhaps for social reasons, right, that eventually accrue into the meaning of the word, the second one is the one that bothers me. The second one is the one that required the asterisk. The second one is the one that, for me, even resisted quotation. There's an extra dimension of meaning. They got the same bias, mm, grant me. They surely got the same truth conditional meaning, and yet they're not equivalent because that other one even resists quotation. Further semantic applications, okay, this is interesting. Is there more to be said? I think there's a lot more to be said about this. Um, I think this gets to the, to the big stuff. This, I, uh, and now, I, I don't, don't ask me. I'm gonna say something, but don't ask questions about this. I think uh, uh, ever since Frege, ever since the Begriff shift, in fact, and then Frege a few years later criticizing it, we thought if only this stuff was quotational, we would get a lot of stuff right. Attitude attributions and a lot of other things. And then you think about it and you're like, yeah, but damn it, it's not quotation. Um, mm, perhaps there is something meaningful, right? Quotation is, uh, right, there is something else out there at the level of phonetic form. That makes a difference, right? That makes a difference, that even makes a difference when John believes that attorneys are rich, we feel it's true, and we are not so happy to say that John believes that attorneys are rich. Did I say it right? The first is John believes that lawyers are rich. Uh, they're supposed to be fully synonymous, right? It's not uh, Hesperus Phosphorus. These are even synonymous. And yet, you know, we like the sound. In that case, for completely different reasons, so I'm just gesticulating completely randomly towards something, but I think that anyway, further semantic applications of meaning at PF could be, well, interesting. That's all I got to say so far, and that's it. Yeah. 
No, that yes, unfortunately, yes, all, all of the yeah. Sorry, go. On. So maybe well, at some moments you you find you find no context in which it seems to be possible to use that word, but uh, the end word, for instance, but there could be you know, a possible future in which the word is accepted in certain groups. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Even now. In fact, uh, yeah. it has been appropriated, yeah. and uh, it is perfectly used among black people. Uh, so this taboo, it seems to be like a, I know, a stage uh, in which bias is a bit extreme, but it's just like, a, let's say, a case of bias, an extreme uh, case of bias. Also because it seems to me that uh, bias is related to expressivity. That's right. So it could also be yep. placed in the phonological form, uh, or close to the phonological form, because it's the idea that, well, there are some contexts in which you are not supposed to pronounce the word. Well, that, yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. Because, because bias is not a question of uttering, it's a question of using. And, and the, the characteristic of taboo, which I grant you... Okay, of, of using, but using means uttering or... And something else. Writing right? it. Yeah. What else? To use a word which is to utter or to write it. Well, with all the, the linguistic intentions that yeah, are behind yeah, use. Yeah, of course, right, yeah. which are not behind mention. And taboo seems to resist mention. That was a test case, so to speak. So it's not a case, it's not just a case of extreme uh, bias. Well, we, we have a lot of extreme biases, in fact, in one direction. Every unbiased word is an extreme bias. Every context is a context in which you can use it. Yeah. Uh, we could invent uh, u useless words. Some people think that slurs are useless in this sense, right? In which they can never use in any context. Fine, all of this, but there's still this extra dimension of meaning in which some words can't even be tokened. If you buy the niggardly story, even tokened in these most extreme accidental scenarios in which write it's almost... And we have it, by the way, I remember when I was a kid, uh, what you get from, the, from when you shoot the gun, the, the ricochet, the thing, is called the rinculo. You can imagine kids love the rinculo because of the culo, right? So, yeah, so those are the things. Um, Yeah. But because I don't know very well if I understand why I cannot say nigger. Yeah. It, and it's yeah. something really weird for me. And I, yeah. I, get, I was wondering, is it something that I don't understand, like something about linguistics, that I do, or something linguistical that I don't understand about English? Or is something more cultural? Yeah. I don't know, more, I don't know what to level it is, but I, I cannot see the point about saying a word. It's something really yeah. English, American, or something. Yeah. Are there words in Italian that you wouldn't say, pronounce? Uh, the, well, quite frankly, I'm a very bad example because I'm. Well, mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the blasphemies. Okay. I mean, yeah, so we, we, we don't care about race and sex and so on in the sense that we're super bigot, so we don't even go there. But uh, God, right? So, so yes, some words, uh, really, I, I do use them, I'm sorry. But even in front of very liberal atheist co colleagues, I wouldn't mention them. So that's something, and um, maybe it's that, that I'm not a uh, really good English competent speaker. Yeah, yeah it's not, a very good. But I would say that it's not something about the language, but something about the culture that I yeah. don't get. I just know that I, I shouldn't say it, but I don't know why. 
Well, that or the last bit is good. I agree. I don't know why. Either. It's just a pure legal. But it's related to what, to what Eleonora is saying. And she was saying, uh, look, there, there are, in fact, contexts in which some people use it. And uh, they even neutralize the taboo. So the taboo is not really so. Yeah. Now, um, is it sociological? I agree with you. I was very surprised when I slowly learned this thing about the N-word. What is the problem? I'm surely not using it. That will be a, quite a problem. But just to make the sound. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's very sociological. Uh, but it's got to be linguistically encoded. There's nothing to do. It's got to do with that word. It's got to do with that sound, in fact. It's got to do with that phoneme, if you want to. And so you're right. It's not, it's not, it's not English. In fact, the, the Oxford English Dictionary, I'm sure, displays the word. Okay, yeah. Uh, but yes. So, yes, I've, I, many people tell me this. It's a sociological. Well, yeah, all of it meaning is sociological. We just happen to converge slowly on something, right? And that too, yeah. And many, many English speakers don't feel that way. Uh, but some do. And they don't do for, uh, I don't know, other things. There's got to be a, a conventional dimension. That's where I'm pushing it. And not all of us need to conform to all dimensions, right? To all conventions, so yeah. Just on a follow up, isn't there a gut example? They try to use it, I would say, so here they, they usually, there's pressure in Spanish, and they would say, literally, you know, it even feels bad saying it, but it says, taking a shit on gut. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and back at home, we say, taking a shit on ten, because, you know, the S. You don't want to oh, it, the there you go. It's like zero. So we are nicer people. Yeah. So we, 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 we the who? <laughs> the expression here is, is even violent for me because you know, but it's not because it's, I mean, not, the word is not a taboo. It's the idea of come on, look, I mean, listen to what you're saying. Ah, okay, good. It, it, very good. For me, for you see, I'm I'm the exactly the opposite. Okay. For me, you know, there is no such thing as God, so I can take a shit. Yeah, I can do whatever. Okay. Right, so that's it. It's the word that still, you know, I was brought up like that. But the, the N word is not a taboo because of, look at, I mean, look at what you're saying, obviously. There's yeah, a, yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. But the other thing is, literally, you're saying this and this is, you know, you don't want to. I don't know. I, I, the taboo might come from different. That, that, okay, I got to concede that, yes. Yeah. You might say, well, you know, quotation, okay, is harmless in itself, but start quoting it 20 times and, and the kids pick it up. And then they start using it. Could be just like that. Yeah. Could be just like that, yes. Maybe more a clarification. I am struggling in understanding, because I'm not very familiar with the distinction. Yeah. With the phonetic and the logic. Right. Well. But I am struggling in making that distinction. Yeah. Why wouldn't have a phonetic, the phonetic part meaning? Uh, no, because you were saying there is a part of meaning there yeah. that we don't know how to uh, account of it. Yeah. But I don't see what, I mean, it's hard yeah. for me. No, no, perfect. To say that in the phonetic part there is no meaning or something like that. Right, yeah, no, but I, I don't mean to say that. So the word dog, of course, is spelled D O G, yeah. and it means those animals, right? So, yes, in that case, the word. But it's just that when you do semantics, in a way, you forget about the fact that it begins with a D and ends with a G. All that matters in semantics is all the properties of meaning. You could, you could call it uh, 526, and then you're like, 526, what is he talking about? You go to the dictionary and like, oh, the thing that once I start speaking out loud, I say dog. But the representative of all the semantic properties couldn't care less whether it's called dog or bog. And it couldn't care less whether it's called attorney or lawyer, if, if really they are fully synonymous. Exactly the same thing, call it what you want, right? So Shakespearean, a rose under the other name was smell as sweet. Right? Uh, and bias is like that. Mm -hmm. right? Call them spook, call them with the N-word, derogatory for African-Americans or whatever. Verse, we have 
they are partially taboos, right? I mean, there's yeah, yeah. like words in which are almost forbidden in any context. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. others that seem to be well appropriate in these coarse situations and the others, right? The con yeah. conditions of correctness for yeah. taboos is, it doesn't exist, or what? This taboo word never appropriate, or, I mean, because this other song of war, I, I have, I don't know the literature, just superficial to this, this guy who said that or slurs should be prohibited. Okay, I was going to go there, right? yeah. So for these guys, that in your terminology means that all slurs would be taboos, so, I mean, complete taboos, no appropriate context of use? No. Uh, what's what? your... No, but so, taboo, I use it as a technical term, you're right, Ta taboo is used in the sense of, don't use the word for one reason or another. I'm using it technically for, for, for it. Well, that's, that's politics, I got an idea, but I got an idea when, you know, spook yeah. is to be used in the mouth of somebody who doesn't like black people yeah. or something like that. Yeah, so there's, there's a context of use. And then, and then, if for political reason you think that you should never express disdains for people of a certain ethnicity, then that word should be forbidden. <laughs> and many people say taboo, that's fine. It's not taboo in my sense, right? It's not. It's not. Uh, what's interesting is the, the, the paper on slurs by, by Anderson and Lepore, where they make a little bit a point of slurs being taboo, a little bit in my sense. They say a lot of things like, look, this is the forbidden word, don't make that sound. All people who do the semantics of slurs are wrong. There's no semantics here. Eh? Uh, I think they're wrong for two different reasons. One, because it, there's too much phenomena that are explained in terms of pots or me or whatever. Um, and those are... But the second thing is, the more interesting thing for me is their, their step, which is completely traditional and fine, is these have to do just with the sheer fact that the sound is forbidden, so it's not a property of meaning. Well, it's a conventional property. Of course it's a property of meaning. Of course it's semantic. Right? I think it's two things. First of all, calling it taboo doesn't mean that it's not semantic. It's going to be a study of meaning, but a strange kind of meaning. And second, that's not derogation. Taboo is another thing. Spook and WAP are derogatory. The N word is derogatory and taboo. Um, right? But for you, because you are in the wrong place. For you, uh, being derogatory or uh, having a certain bias means that the word shouldn't be pronounced in certain contexts, shouldn't be, uh, don't make the, those sounds, or don't write those signs in the, certain No, the, the derogatory for me, but again, it's, it's my terminology, I think a little bit. Derogatory has to do with bias. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I got nothing to say about that, I don't think it's well, a semantic. the idea is that you are restricted in using those words to certain contexts. Yeah. So you could say, well, don't pronounce uh, no, no, pronounce you, don't pro pronounce you can, put quotation marks around it. Don't use faggot unless you want to denigrate homosexual. Okay. It would be good, for, for instance, to, to say uh, uh, okay, okay, I see the point, okay. But with taboo, with me, don't even put quotation marks, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's bad. Can you put this up? That's semantic. I say that's semantic just because it's conventional. You can push me on this. But in a sense, it's meaning. That's what I was talking with John, right? It's, there's nothing, it's not that it's an unpleasant sound in, in, naturally, that birds fly away or something. Right? It's just because the conventions of uh, a certain kind of English made it a taboo word. You know, the, fir the first commandment, or maybe another one. Um, well, I don't know, obviously, I don't know whatever language it was written in originally. Um, but uh, in English, uh, don't pronounce the, the name of God. I never understood whether it's wrong, uh, in vain. Whether it's wrong to just bring up God with any name, or whether there's a problem with God. And both things are anthropologically attested. Some communities say you just shouldn't speak of the divinity, right? 
it's uh, improper for a finite creature like us to even mention what? Mention, you know, the stuff. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Another thing is the word. Huh? You can't mention the divinity with that three-letter word, right? You know which one, right? Mm. G-O-D. Perhaps you can say G-O-D. Like in front of children, let's have some I-C-E-C. -E -E. Right. Uh, don't say the G-O-D word. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Monty Python. Huh? What do you mean, God? Ah! <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, so there's a difference there. There's two dimensions. One is bias. Roughly, this last example was a bit humorous. The other is just the word. And even with same truth conditional meaning, same bias, some words are worse than others. Spook is better than, well, better is terribly derogatory. Bad, bad, bad. Never use it. I didn't use it. But I quoted it with not much. And the N word, yes, you write me too, quite frankly, if it comes from, you know, very familiar with people who are a little bit. But there's still that fact that it's a little bit harder to quote. So that's it. Not to mention in Italian the, 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 the blasphemies, right? The, the DIO, cane, porco, and all those things. Here is that, that you have to be more yeah, 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 week, I guess, uh, I was teaching and a student uh, wanted to complain about something that I, I can't remember what, but, but I asked them to do something or something like that, and she wanted to complain, and instead of saying mierda, that is the normal, she said miércoles, and yeah, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. what? Yeah. And she was like, miércoles, yeah. and then I realized, ah, she didn't want yeah. to say mierda, yeah. well, but the thing is that she's complaining anyhow, so, so she was mixing, I, and I think with all these taboo things, it's like a, like they are mixing two levels of things. It's a community that she was still uh, complaining, even if she didn't say the word mierda. Yeah. So the problem is not with the pronunciation of that word. And I would say that American people with the bigger world have the same confusion. It's like yeah. the problem is not with these letters. The problem is with the expression they use, you do with that. And, and I cannot see farther on this. Yeah, but the miércoles thing sounds like a childish thing. I mean, it's the kind of thing children do. You don't say mierda, you say miércoles. And, you know, yeah, but this doesn't so, so maybe the student is a bit childish. Yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't have to do with the taboo. It's just like they say ole yeah, and yeah. ola. Instead of ola, it's, it's just silly. Well, ole or ola is normal here. But, you know, yeah. mierda, miércoles, it sounds like a child talking. Yeah, but the right. yeah. negative is not the same thing. Like, you want to say this word, what? I, I don't know. Because it's insulting. But it's insulting yeah. if, you, if you used to insult it. Insult. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use it, so if in a different use, the word itself doesn't have anything. So I, I, I cannot. I don't know. You, you know where it is. Yeah, I No, it was just ironic to make sense, but. In the case of in, in religious cases, it might make sense to become a word that you cannot say because just yeah. the act of saying yeah. it, it might Good. grant you a really bad Good. afterlife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so it, you have a real well no. Uh, not a real reason, because so you have a real reason which is false, but <laughs> but you have a reason. Yeah, you have a reason, of course you have a reason. Yeah. 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 But and I think that the mechanist might go in that direction, yeah. even in the cases where there is not a threat for right, yes. racial yeah. and other yeah. that it, it, The mechanism might be the same in... in yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that, yeah. But, very happy. but there is not a, this kind of threatening thing. No, 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 fine, fine, yeah, you're right. And so I, I'm conceding all the examples, but you're giving me a very good example that I'm, I would be happy. Right? And in fact, in fact, I think you're right, it, it happens. I, I'm not an anthropologist, but I think it does happen, that you have those taboo yeah. words. But even if it doesn't, it couldn't. Right? But I make up a fictional scenario, a thought experiment, and there it is. The sound, 
can't be said because, you know, you get the, the little lightning doot on your hand. Uh, why? Well, of course, it's a religious superstition, social and so on. Yeah, okay, but why that sound? Isn't that a linguistic convention? It seems to be that it is. And so I call it meaning. Can you repeat that? What did you say? Let's, say, let's make up this thing that uh, uh, I tell you, you know, the sound N-O-G could never be pronounced, otherwise you go to hell. Right? And so, you go like, mm -hmm. okay. uh, that's a linguistic convention about nog, right? So it's an aspect of meaning. It's meant. Huh? Right, okay. And that's the thing that, so even if I quote, oh, the priest said that I should never pronounce nog. Oh, you go to hell, right? So it's, it's a thing that it's this kind of conventional aspect that's got to do just with the sound. So, yeah, that was yeah, uh, that, yeah, I mean, just remembering Kaplan saying that, well, even if there is a different meaning, part of it can be the answer to why these guys are using these words. I mean, it can be because they have this sacred, yeah. right, the marchers, or how is the example? Oh, the I don't Okay, Wittgenstein and Machers, or Machers, or right. whatever. Uh, they use one word on the weekdays, and, yeah, yeah. and they another word in sacred ways, <laughs> and they are completely the same, truth condition of speaking, and blah, blah, And, well, he has this difference in which some difference in meaning can answer to the question of why they use these words instead yeah. of the other. And then he defends, as far as I remember, that that's not semantic. Right. Would right? surprise me. Yeah. So, so I think maybe that's terminological. I, I don't know about yeah. what counts as semantic information and what a pragmatic yeah. information. But and actually, it seems like well, <laughs> why does someone use miracles instead of well, well, I no, don't know the example yeah. but, uh, with sir, yeah. when does he one use niggers instead of African American? Well, yeah. I don't know. what's I mean, but not I, all yeah. the cases. I mean, the, all the cases that maybe are different, slightly like different. I think that passage, I don't remember the passage, but the spirit seems to be when he was arguing about distinguishing semantics from what he calls metasemantics. The reason why the word means that. Yeah, the difference, yeah. I mean, what you put, I mean, going yeah. to not true condition of the aspects of meaning, what goes into the semantic and what counts as nice. mathematic information. So he gives yeah. this example about, yeah. and I remember about the sacred thing, right? He says, well, they say this on Saturdays because well, they have their religion and say, well, use this word yeah. in sacred days. But the fact that, that that is not part of semantic information, he says. Yeah. Okay, now it's starting to look a bit because terminological. Yeah. The yeah. I mean, of course, using one word or the other makes a difference and have an explanation. But the explanation is not linguistic, it's yeah. religious. Yeah, so that's what. Was as long as it's religious, yeah. even if it's conventional, it's not prime, it's not semantic. Linguistic, at least, let's call it practice, linguistic, yeah. Social practice versus yeah. conventional, conventional meaning or yeah. something like that, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whether we call it semantics or not, I think, I think it is not a big deal, yeah. depending on... Uh, but many of you, starting with Maria's original yeah. intervention, are like, well, this doesn't seem to be, let's call it linguistic, as you said now. Yeah. And I'm saying, well, is it encoded in the world? Isn't there something to be said about it? Uh, yeah, 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 you're right. Good. Good point. So, yeah, um, you, okay, yes. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I don't know if I'm making exactly the same point or if I'm missing absolutely the <laughs> point, but you know, let, let me try. I mean, I think that that the feeling that the phenomenon is not semantic or linguistic. Yeah. I guess it's exactly the same point, but yeah. I know, let me put you an example, a very silly example that happened to me once, which involves taboo, yeah. but it's not clear to me that it has to do with language, yeah. but it's similar to the examples that we are using, and it doesn't have to do with drugs. I mean, I was, at, I was teaching in a high school, and uh, what we were talking about, uh, transgender people and transsexual people and the differences and so on. So I asked the students, uh, okay, uh, we had an example, uh, she's a transgender, she's not a transsexual, 
Why? What's the difference? And the answer by one of the students, Danny, was, well, you know, she has one of it. It what? You know, that. Yeah. That what? I don't see the demonstration. You know, the thing that you use to be, okay, penis. You say penis. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, absolutely right. It was an example of taboo. Yeah. But taboo about, I agree, not linguistic. That's a taboo about the object. Call it what you want, don't mention it. Yeah, yep. but it seems to me that it's exactly the same phenomena as with nigger. Well, yeah, but it's, it's got to do with the word. No, very good but point, very good point. It has to do with anything encoded in the word phoenix. It has to do with, you don't talk about genitalia of your teacher. Right. So it seems to me that the explanation of this phenomena that you want to explain has nothing to do with what's encoded in the word. Right. No, that's, it that's, mean, yeah, 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 it is, or, it is. I don't know, maybe another example, maybe it's going too far, maybe it's too different, I don't know, but uh, another taboo, okay? Uh, there is a film festival here, a horror uh, film festival here in Sosovia, yeah. and like five years ago, they banned uh, a film because it depicted uh, the uh, rape and murder of a uh, newborn baby. <laughs> Hey, it's fiction. Uh, it's fiction. Right. It's like they are not using it. They are mentioning it, yeah. you know, the, uh, yeah. as a metaphor. But they ban it. It seems to me yeah. it's the same sort of phenomenon. It, it, but but it, it, well, okay, that uh, you know, for some things like uh, you know displaying bodily waste at dinner table, we got a biological reaction, we don't want it for revolutionary reasons, so let's put that aside. But, 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 the case, but the case is you said, yes, many things, many things are taboo, the object is taboo. So you don't want to talk about penises with any word, call it dick, call it genitalia, call it penis, you just don't want to talk about that. That's nothing. I think there's a, you're right, exactly the same thing with sound, with certain sounds. And, okay, so you say, yeah, so it's the same thing. Yeah, fine, it is the same thing. But the sound has got something associated to it in English, because that sound in, uh, uh, in Swahili doesn't, doesn't do anything. So to me, that's enough to call it a linguistic convention. Even though you're all right, it's very special, it's not... Uh, I don't know, not even been the dictionary, but... Why you use it? It's a language, that's pretty much it. You're right, you're right, that's it. But it's good enough, right? Yeah, but you're absolutely, that's, that's the bottom line. It happens to be a, a sound that, by, a, as a physical object, doesn't do anything. It's got a conventional thing attached to it. Yeah, that's what meaning is. Right? Yeah, the last one, yes, yes. To make a clear difference. So, and I was saying that intention has a lot to do with the use of some of those words, yep. right? So you can distinguish between passive endorsement, and blah, blah, and uh, your speech act doesn't count, blah, blah, but you don't have that intention, or you mentioned no, nothing. Very good, yeah. I mean, so yeah. Because intention has nothing to do. Yeah, but because I'm doing something. It doesn't something. change a block or, or make permissible right. one taboo. With quotation marks because right. clear the speaker yeah. right. No, because because this is semantics in this sense. In this sense. Yeah. So but then I will add the intention. I mean. Yeah, but but you know then the, the speech act theory I haven't said anything about any of that. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. lots of intentions there. Yeah. yeah Taboo. But, yeah. Even it seems really like you know <coughs> if I cough and it really sounds like cunt. That's a word that I can say. Well, it's very very bad. Mm -hmm. um, mm, mm. Have a little bit better next time, please. Hmm? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taboo is really, really resistant to whatever. Yeah. Can be justified a little bit, but, but still, the echoes are there. Hmm? Hmm? I mean, yeah, look, if, if, if you, going back to, there's a lot of parallels with the non-linguistic, right? If you're genuinely sick, not your fault, and you throw up in the middle of the room, yeah, it's not my fault, but you're like, yeah, but for the law, God, right? It's a little bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.